Okay, welcome, and uh, please state your name and organization for the record, and please begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Tan Yan. I'm on behalf of the China Chamber of International Commerce, CCOIC. This is uh, my assistant lawyer, Mr. Guan Jian. CCOIC is a national chamber of commerce in China with more than 180,000 enterprise members across various sectors. CCOIC and our members have witnessed substantial progress China have made in IP rights protection. We wish to assist the USTR to gain a more accurate understanding of China's IPR protection and related market access so as to carry out contractive cooperation in IPR protection, which will in turn benefit the people of both countries. As we have elaborated in our written comments, since 2018, China has made even greater achievements in IPR protection for domestic and foreign IP right holders. It is our view that China has be removed from the priority watch list in 2019. In 2018, in order to establish a better regulatory framework, China revised or is revising major <coughs> IP legislations, for instance, the patent law amendment draft substantially revised more than 33 articles and significantly strengthened <coughs> patent protection. A new anti-unfair competition law substantially increased the level of legal liabilities for all, all kinds of unfair competition activities. The foreign investment law draft, which explicitly prohibits forced transfer, a technology transfer was revealed by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress and is expected to pass soon. In 2018, China overhauled the inter intellectual property administration system at both the national and the provincial level in order to improve IP reviews quality and operational efficiency, for example. The, registri reg the registration review cycle for trademark was shortened from eight months to six months, surpassing the average level of prior rights review parties in the OECD countries. In 2018, China continued to I intensify IP law enforcement, for instance, the number of patent law enforcement cases was 77,000, increased 15.9% from last year. 31,000 illegal trademark cases were investigated. The National Intellectual <coughs> Property Administration published the Internet Plus Intellectual Property Protection Work Plan to promote the efficiency of combating IP infringement. Most remarkably, 38 ministerial departments jointly issued a memorandum of cooperation on joint punishment for serious dishonest subjects in the field of intellectual property patent to enhance the effectiveness of IP law enforcement. <coughs> in 2018, China advanced the judicial reform of IP protection. The quality, efficiency, and consistency of IP adjudication was significantly improved. For instance, the Supreme People's Court, SBC, established a unified appellate division exclusively for intellectual property appeals. Two new internet courts were created in Beijing and Guangzhou. SBC issued provisions on several issues concerning application of law in 
review of cases involving behavior preservation in intellectual property rights disputes so that right holders can get timely, adequate, and effective relief in the event of IP violations. In 2018, China markedly relaxed market access. On June 28, China published special administrative measures for foreign investment access negative list, reducing restrictions from 63 to 48, and, and, introducing, and introducing new opening up measures in 22 sectors. As WTO has noted, China remains one of the top foreign investment recipients, and China in involved FDI has kept rising for many years. In conclusion, China has made remarkable achievements in IPR protection. We believe China should be removed from the priority watch list in 2019. Thanks. Thank you. We will begin questions with USTR. Thank you for your testimony. We continue to receive reports that patent infringement damage awards in China are very low relative to U.S. damages, and that in some cases the damages are not deterrent. Do you have a position on that, and what has been the experience of your members? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, according to the, uh, the draft revised the patent law, the damages uh, could be awarded by the court has been substantially increased. And uh, if I have the number on hand, uh, it was uh, increased from uh, 10,000 to 30,000, and the maximum award could be 5 million RMB, according to the draft uh, patent law. Thank you. As a follow-up question, um, I understand that the, the draft law contains those provisions. However, in practice, um, since uh, that time, have have your members experienced any increased damages awarded? And, uh, based on my, my personal experience, there was certain uh, kind of award that was in, uh, substantially incre increased the damage awarded to the, uh, the IPR holders. And I would like to give some more uh, details in cases after this hearing and uh, submit in the post-hearing submission. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is from the State Department. Your submission mentioned the 2018 patent law amendment draft contains a change to the rules of evidence in order to resolve the hard to prove problem. Could you elaborate on this, please? OK. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the question. And the draft patent law uh, uh, kind of uh, streamlines the procedures for the uh, IPR holders to uh, submit evidence in the court. And uh, they also set a certain standards and the criteria for uh, which kind of standards should be made for a court to accept this kind of evidence. So and, uh, there was a lot of uh, details in the draft uh, patent law. And uh, if I may, I would like, or I'd like to write any details in uh, the post-hearing submission. Thank you. We have one final question uh, from the U.S. Copyright Office. Can you provide uh, any update on uh, the status of efforts to amend the copyright law? Uh, there's, uh, based on my understanding, there was uh, the amendment to the copyright law was on agenda. Um, we uh, expect there will, would be a substantial movement for that amendment to the copyright law in, in, the re in, in this year. Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is the Computer and Communications Industry Association. Thank you. Uh, please state your name and organization for the record and begin your testimony. Sure. Matt Shears for the Computer and Communications Industry Association. Thank you for the chance to convey CCIA's views on the Special 301 process this year and 
thank you to the committee for all the effort, the time and resources that, that you invest in this important process. <coughs> As an association of internet and technology firms, CCIA members' exports are considerably affected by the domestic intellectual property laws of the countries into which we export in our uh, trading partners. Um, these exports benefit, obviously, from intellectual property protection. Uh, they are also significantly impeded when the markets in which they're operating lack the copyright exceptions that enable innovation uh, which have been set down in uh, bilateral or multilateral instruments. I will focus my oral remarks on two examples of that that are described at greater length in our written submission. Uh, first, the need for implementation of intermediary protections abroad, particularly where uh, those have already been required by our free trade agreements. Uh, and secondly, I want to emphasize CCIA's growing concern about the rise of uh, link or snippet taxes in foreign markets. So uh, first, the issue of online uh, intermediary protections. Uh, U.S. firms operating abroad face an increasingly hostile environment uh, in a variety of markets which are impeding the ability to export services. Uh, these conditions manifest through a variety of new copyright laws and regulations as well as court interpretations. Uh, which in a number of cases are explicitly targeting U.S. firms, and if not explicitly, then, then certainly implicitly. Uh, the Special 301 process should be used to identify areas where our trading partners' protections fall short of agreed-upon U.S. implemented norms. Um, in particular, uh, U.S. trading partners who have entered into free trade agreements uh, have, have neglected for, in some cases, many years to honor uh, long-standing commitments in the intellectual property chapters. And uh, as our written submission describes at greater length, uh, our trading partners, including particularly Australia and Colombia, have yet to bring copyright law into alignment with uh, their commitments, despite having many years to do so, and have directly amended legislation uh, amended the, uh, the provisions of their law where these implementation obligations exist. So it's not like the issue has, uh, is, you know, uh, is, is a subject that cannot be uh, opened, right? It's, uh, these, these laws have been amended and these particular obligations have been neglected. Uh, this, to some extent, leaves our trading partners with the impression that uh, our U.S. FTAs are comprised of air quote commitments and real commitments, uh, and we would not want to find trading partners uh, testing the waters as to which are which. Uh, so the second issue I mentioned is the spread of link or quotation taxes, uh, sometimes referred to as ancillary or neighboring rights. Um, these have uh, grown in foreign markets. Um, uh, which we have been raising in this process for several years. Uh, we appreciate the uh, Special 301 Committee and the NTE process for evaluating this and taking note of this issue. Uh, unfortunately, the problem continues to develop. Uh, we've witnessed detrimental laws throughout Europe, um, including member states Spain, Germany, and France. The EU Copyright Directive now being explored in Brussels would uh, create a, a, a a pan-European problem on this front, um, and, and the directive is only a floor. Uh, even as we speak, the Swiss legislature is considering introducing a 10-year snippet tax uh, in their ongoing uh, copyright reform, which will considerably exceed the EU directive. Uh, there's, there's no limit to the rents that could be extracted from U.S. services through these kinds of processes. Um, and as CCI has previously noted, these clearly uh, contradict uh, our trading partners' burden convention and thereby their TRIPS obligations. Um, so in conclusion, uh, the Special 301 process should identify discriminatory practices directed uh, in particular at U.S. Internet services through the creation of these new rights or through failure to meet long-standing obligations involving intermediaries. Um, thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thank you. We'll begin questions with USTR. Thank you for your testimony. 
You identify several concerns about policies related to intellectual property in various markets. However, you do not make any recommendations about the listing of these countries. For example, you identify concerns with the European Union and Australia and other countries without making recommendations about listings. How do you think this input should be reflected in the Special 301 report? Are you equally concerned about all trading partners you mentioned? So my proposal uh, would be that uh, watch listing should be reserved for countries that have failed to meet uh, explicit obligations. I, I am aware that a number of constituencies have come before the committee saying uh, we would like to see uh, our trading partners implement uh, the following laws. And, and indeed, uh, as, as CCIA and many other constituents have long told this committee, we regard U.S. copyright law as a gold standard which uh, our trade policy should be to export. Uh, this, this particular process seems most appropriately focused on identifying failure to meet existing commitments. And so where we are talking about FTAs, such as we have with Australia, Colombia, Peru, where commitments have gone unmet for many years, uh, in some jurisdictions even acknowledge that the commitment has gone unmet and then taking no action, that that would be an appropriate context for watch listing. And, and similarly, uh, with respect to the uh, snippet and link taxes, the, the, the clear inconsistency with Byrne Article 10.1, which of course we regard as having trade implications by virtue of TRIPS, uh, is, is also a basis. Uh, that's not to say that other jurisdictions aren't pursuing policies that, that may prove problematic, but uh, that we should reserve watch listing for, for countries that are clearly out of step with explicit uh, um, commitments already made. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from the U.S. Copyright Office. Regarding Colombia's recent copyright legislation, you noted the absence of what you deem, quote, widely recognized exceptions such as text and data mining, display of snippets or quotations, and other non-expressive or non-consumptive uses, end quote. Could you provide further details about how other nations provide such, such exceptions in their laws? So, uh, as a... Um you know, as, as scholars of, of U.S. copyright, of course, we, we'll know that the, the U.S. has no such explicit exception and relies on uh, the uh, flexible and equitable doctrine fair use to handle many of, uh, many of those use cases. Uh, there are trading partners, U.S. trading partners, uh, particularly Commonwealth nations, achieve the same um, through a, a fair dealing doctrine. Uh, obviously, many countries have also looked to the U.S. and implemented their own application of fair use. Um, so uh, I, I would not suggest that uh, an explicit one-for-one -one implementation of these of, of such exceptions is required, but we should look at flexibilities understood broadly, and in some cases, uh, uh, flexible rules of reason like for use and for dealing may be an appropriate context to do that. Um, uh, you know, this is a case where uh, we obviously want to promote U.S. norms. Um, but there, the obligations uh, that, that these countries will have will are somewhat limited to what's in, in Bern, <coughs> Article 10.1 and Article 2's News of the Day exception, right, which are, are more confined. Um, so obviously we should expect uh, people to meet those commitments and, and encourage them to adopt the approach that the U.S. has adopted. Thank you. Uh, we have one last question uh, from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Thank you. Are there markets that, in your view, do a good job of balancing the respective rights and obligations of content providers and internet service providers, or ISPs? What would those markets be and why? Well, I think, as I, as I mentioned previously, uh, we regard the, the U.S. Uh, approach to uh, copyright as the gold standard and something that we should encourage our, our trading partners to adopt, in, in large part because of the success stories we have here, a, a very strong and robust creative sector and a very strong and robust uh, uh, market for exporting digital services. Um, we, uh, when we struck that balance, there are many examples of other jurisdictions following our lead. Uh, and we should encourage them to do so. And there are emerging consensuses on, on these issues, including intermediary protection, and I'd say emerging consensus on, on uh, technology-friendly flexibilities. 
uh, and we should uh, foster that consensus and try and bring our trading partners in, in compliance with our approach. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Uh, the last uh, organization before the lunch break is the Consortium for Common Food Names. Please state your name and organization for the record and please begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jaime Castaneda and I represent the Consortium for Common Food Names. The Consortium of Common Food Names, or CCFN, is a non-profit alliance that represents the interest of farmers, food producers, and consumers. Our mission is to preserve the legitimate right of producers worldwide to use generic names. Mr. Chairman and members of the Interagency Committee, we appreciate the opportunity to address the continuing problems that illegitimate uh, practices involving geographical indications, or GIs, have caused for the U.S. and international food industry. Let me start by making one thing very clear. CCFN is not opposed to genuine geographical indication or certification marks. We have no issue with Napa Valley wine or Idaho potatoes, or for that matter, a wide variety of other compound name GIs describing products that are genuinely unique and whose qualities are inherently defined by the specific region in which they were produced. Intellectual property is very important, and we should defend the rights of trademark holders. But we should, and I emphasize, we should equally protect and support the rights of people who use generic food names. Over hundreds of years, various types of cheeses, meats, wines, and many other foods and beverages have been produced outside the areas where they originated, including those from Europe. Despite this, the EU has of late chosen to respond to legitimate gro growing global competition, not by upping its own game, but instead, instead by seeking to erect roadblocks to other suppliers to artificially favor its own producers. The misuse, this misuse of GIs to create barriers of, to trade is unjust and must not be tolerated. The EU is very clear in its intentions. Already, right here in the U.S. market, we have seen European groups attempt to seize usage of specific names, including Parmigiano, Asiago, Romano, and Gruyere, among many others. Their goal is to increase their market share by blocking U.S. competition and forcing U.S. companies to rebrand, which confuses consumers and re results in U.S. companies losing markets. Consider that in some areas where the EU is trying to confiscate a generic name, they don't even have a market there yet, but we do. For instance, there is little or no Italian made Asiago in some developing markets in Latin America. How can we stand by and allow the EU to steal generic names of our products and push us out? The answer is we cannot. What is the value of the U.S. gaining no or low tariff into a country's market in an FDA if U.S. producers are then banned from selling products in the country due to new GI concessions to the EU? Last year, we were extremely disappointed to see the previous Mexican government of President Peña Nieto cave into EU demands and relinquish many valuable names, giving the EU a virtual monopoly on these products implementation of this agreement. We have a number of different products already in the market. We were the only ones in this market. Over the past few years, the U.S. government has been supportive on the common names issue, but our opponents are gaining ground because we have not done enough to shore up our existing market access rights. To meet this challenge, the U.S. government must step up, its, step up its game to match or exceed the force that Europe has thrown behind its GI agenda. <coughs> it's not enough to warn our trading partners to not give up generic names to the EU. The U.S. must insist upon it by securing binding commitments from our trading partners that preserve our market access rights. A new economic study supports previous studies and helps lay out the consequences for one of the EU, EU's primary targets, the whole issue of GIs. To counter this risk of keep having the EU, European Union uh, crawl into different markets, 
Uh, we urge the administration to secure commitments from our trading partners to build upon the positive precedent established in USMCA side letter agreement with Mexico, which even though it excludes some generic names, it, it sets a, a, a clear precedent that we have these products uh, trading uh, freely in between markets. In addition, we encourage the administration to evaluate the full range of tools at its disposal, disposal to address the deeply asymmetrical nature of the U.S.-EU food trade relationship. The U U.S. is a large and lucrative market for many European food mark makers, even as the e EU bans the import of accurately labeled common names U.S. foods into their own market. It is time to enhance U.S. efforts and to enhold our trading partners to their commitments. We look forward to continue to work closely with your government agencies in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will start questions off with USTR. Thank you for your testimony. In your submission, you highlight the United Kingdom as an example of a country that has taken a reasonable approach to GIs and highlight the example of the UK's multiple GIs for types of cheddar, which make clear that use of the generic term cheddar is preserved. Could you elaborate on why you consider this to be an appropriate approach for the protection of GIs? And could this approach be used in other countries? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Uh, so we have been promoting for uh, many, many years the whole issue of compound names. There is no problem. Uh, understanding that there is a product that may be coming specifically from a specific region. So uh, in the case of uh, Provolone de Valpadano in Italy or, or the case of uh, Brie de Menu, uh, Camembert de Normandie. So we are not being confused. Consumers will not be confused. It is completely understandable that if we go through that approach, people know what they're buying. But the European Union, that's not their intent. The European Union wants to actually have complete monopoly of these names and complete, more importantly, complete monopoly of markets that have been uh, developed by the U.S. Specifically, examples are, for instance, Mexico. Thank you. The next question comes from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Thank you. <clears throat> On Singapore, you've raised a concern in your submission regarding implementation of the obligations concerning GIs in the 2012 EU Singapore FTA. What is the status, if you know, of any regulations and guidance being issued addressing the issue of their implementation? I think that let me let me uh, and I can come back with you with uh, more specifics uh, uh, to the to the interagency <laughs> committee. But what I, what I can assure you is that even though in many cases, like in the case of Singapore, we thought positive uh, as, as well as in Japan and other places, uh, the way that actually Singapore handled the overall negotiations with Europe, we're constantly concerned of how Europe is continued to push and uses different angles and different avenues to try to undermine their own negotiations. So what we have to be uh, absolutely clear is that we need to be vigilant of what the EU continues to do in a number of different countries. But I'll, I'll get back to you on, on a specifics. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, next, we have a question from the Department of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. My question is related to Japan. In your submission, you commended Japan for having a, tra <coughs> a transparent process while also expressing concern that Japan restricted some terms, such as various wine terms and other single word GIs, but not others. Could you please elaborate on this? Yeah, thank you. This goes a little bit to, to the point that we were just making before. I think Japan, as, as, as well as Singapore and others, uh, made a concerted effort, and, and if you, uh, I, I can't expand too much because we have a limited amount of time, but if you follow the, 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 the path that Japan uh, uh, went about in trying to secure uh, a sui generis GI system that would continue to protect uh, generic names, I think that that was very um, uh, commendable. 
Uh, having said that, uh, the EU, and we know this for a fact, they pressure on the negotiations. I mean, we have the example of Canada that at the last minute, I mean, they were offering the Canadians a few more pounds of pork and other products for in exchange of protecting Asiago. So uh, in many of these cases, uh, the issue has been that at the, end, at the end of the day, even though Japan has followed a, a, a legal system as opposed to other countries, uh, they, they were uh, pushed to accept by the European Union on some of these uh, names that we consider generic. Thank you very much for your testimony.